everybody. Um, thank you very much for hanging in there. I know it's been a long day. Um, my name is Greg Rohde. I'm one of the old hands around here. I remember call, uh, speaking at one of the very first conferences that Ina had. It was held in Belgium, and it seemed like it was only a bunch of speakers speaking to each other. Um, <laughs> but it's been wonderful over the years to see the growth of Ina, not just in terms of numbers, but also in terms of leadership. And a few years ago, um, under the leadership of Ina, uh, partnering with companies like Google and British Telecom and some public safety authorities, um, because of the leadership of Ina, developed new technology that could help identify one or two phone calls that have made a, a huge difference. So this panel today is about um, advanced mobile location, which is that technology that was developed uh, through the leadership of Google and Ina and, and, and some others. Um, and uh, it's, it's already been deployed in well over 20 countries around the world. And so we have a great panel here to discuss it. Uh, we'll be starting with uh, Benoit Vivier of Ina. He's going to give an update on the, some of the deployment and standardization issues. And then we'll have some presentations by some officials from Google, as well as from Orange in Belgium, and look at those issues. And so to the panel, I'm going to warn you that you are the last thing in front of this audience and happy hour. <laughs> So if I, I apologize in advance if I'm a little rude and in interrupting you to cut you off, but I'm only doing it to keep the audience on our side. So <laughs> with that, Benoit, would you please give us your update? Thank you, Greg. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. And I'll try to be brief as yeah, Greg interesting, instructed me. So uh, I'm Benoit Vivier. Most of you know me. I'm public affairs manager at INA. And usually at the INA conference uh, for the past few years, I've been presenting, giving a short update before the session on AML on like what has been happening since the last conference. And actually, initially, uh, Gary Machado asked me to do that update again this year. And first, to be honest with you, I thought I'm not going to do it because not much has been happening since last time. And I didn't want to do it and to be on stage to, um, today, tonight. And um, finally, Gary insisted, and since I want my pay raise at the end of the year, I just did not contract contradict my, my boss. So I'm here, and I'm giving that update about AML. And actually, to do that um, update, I started with the slides that I presented last time we met in Dubrovnik at the INA conference in April 2019. And actually, that was the state of deployment of AML in Europe two years and a half ago. And then I realized that actually, yes, like it makes sense to give this update because um, yeah, a lot has been happening since then. Oops, I'm going to maybe remove my mask because you'll hear me better. Yeah, that might be better like that. And so this is where we are now with the uh, deployment of AML. So you can see that between 2019 and 2021, the map of Europe has gotten pretty full, right? So now most of countries of the European Union are blue. We still see some like gray stains, <laughs> if I may say. Uh, and actually, two more countries on that map are currently piloting AML. So very shortly, they will turn blue. Uh, I feel like I'm giving the weather forecast, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, this is the state of deployment of AML, uh, most of European countries. And we can hope that next year, it will almost all be, be blue. So it's, it's actually getting a thing in Europe. And we, uh, we can all be proud of that, because we've all been pass part of that story right? since uh, uh, the past five years. And if I continue uh, a bit uh, with the legislation, actually, uh, a big part of the achievement we've seen uh, in with the previous map uh, is actually due to the European Electronic Communications Code. Uh, you probably know what it is now, because we've been talking about that for months and months. Uh, so it basically gives an obligation on PSAPs to basically receive uh, AML-based positions. And it is now in force. And the deadline basically to implement that legislation was December 2020. So if I go back to the map before, you can see that a few European countries are late with the transposition and are now exposed to uh, financial sanctions from the European Commission and actually the Commission in investigating that. So uh, that will also help speed on the, the, the implementation of, um, of AML. We have other legislations. And actually, this one was announced during the previous INA conference from an official from the European Commission. It's basically uh, an obligation on the handset manufacturers that start, like as of March 2022, if you want to sell a phone in the European Union, you have to have AML in your phone or a technology similar to AML. Um, so yeah, that's something that is being implemented and uh, uh, the, the entry into application is March 2022. So it's, uh, it's looming. 
Uh, then we have also the roaming regulation, which is being discussed. Actually, the current roaming regulation that we have that allows us to, um, to roam here for free uh, in Latvia as Europeans, sorry for the Americans, uh, it expires in June 2022. So new legislation is being discussed. And uh, in that new legislation, there are some, um, some elements that are related to emergency communications and especially to location information. And in those elements, you have uh, basically the obligation on mobile network operators to co cooperate between them to allow the transmission of location information for a user who is roaming in another country. And you also have the, the obligation to MNOs to make sure that they will zero rate the transmission of location information. That is in the proposal that is currently being discussed right now. It will be approved by European institutions probably in the next weeks, um, probably somewhere in the uh, beginning of November. So it's, it's also quite imminent. And since I'm at INA, I'm talking <laughs> to you about the privacy regulation, which is about the, um, basically giving an exemption to emergency services to uh, get the location information without having to request the, the consent from the, from the caller. This is in discussion since 2017, so it's quite long to adopt. There's a lot of disagreements, not on that very provisions, but on others. Uh, you know that privacy is highly controversial when it's being discussed. And uh, actually an agreement will probably be reached by the end of the year, finally. And you might think that it will not impact you too much, and actually you're quite right. Uh, because we already have a directive for that, which is from 2002. And what this legislation is about is basically to make it more modern, because obviously in 2002, the situation of telecommunications was not as it is right now. So this is something that is being discussed. Apart from that, uh, I know I have very little time left, so uh, we are discussing other things and doing many more things uh, about AML. And actually at INA, our team is now uh, rich of one more person working on AML is uh, Freddie McBride, uh, who's here, and you got time to know him now. And uh, together with, uh, with Freddie now, we're working on solving a few issues, including roaming. We'll have some presentation about that later. Uh, provision of additional data available, not only the location, but all the types of data that you can get. I know there's still the, some issues related to the transmission of uh, HTT via HTTPS uh, with some missing MSISDN, and we're working on solving those, uh, those issues. And actually, what we thought, uh, yeah, I'm just wrap, wrapping up, what we thought was that um, it's a good way to combine SMS and HTTPS. So for that, we need to find a unique identifier to basically match them. We're working on improving the overall success rates. We'll also have a presentation on that. And obviously, some standardization work still uh, ongoing at MTEL. And I am done. Thank you. Thank you, Benoit. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Next, we're going to hear from a couple f officials from Google. Uh, Fiona Lee and um, Alistair Fries are going to do a short presentation about this, and then we'll go to a video after that. Hi, everybody. Uh, let's see. Is our presentation coming up? Great. So I'm here to talk to you about uh, new ELS features and capabilities since we last met in Croatia two and a half years ago, um, and also uh, ELS Data SMS version 2 that we have just launched and we're looking for com uh, countries to pilot with us. And then Alistair's going to take over from there and, and then Salvo afterwards. So before we go into new features, just a very quick refresher um, on ELS. It's a free service from Google, supplemental. It sends enhanced location whenever a user calls or texts an emergency number. It um, uses something called Fuse Location Provider, which is the technology responsible for the blue dot in Google Maps, to com compute accurate location indoors and outdoors using Wi-Fi, GPS, uh, cell tower, and sensors on the phone, right? So it is uh, very scalable. It works on 99% of Android phones out there, as long as the phone runs Android OS 4.1 and up and has Google Play services installed. It's privacy-centric. Uh, it only activates when the user dials an emergency number and location is computed on the phone and transmitted uh, to public safety. Um, and then finally, Google makes it free, so it's easy and doesn't cost uh, public safety to adopt it. And we use uh, industry standard protocols, data SMS and HTTP, so that it's easy for you to integrate into your, uh, into your existing infrastructure. 
So today we're live in 34 countries covering a population of 950 million plus people. Actually, the number's higher now. Um, and then over 600,000 emergency calls. In Europe, uh, Benoit showed a map. We are live in 23 countries, available to 400 plus people, million people, and uh, almost 200,000 emergency calls a day. Okay, so new features. Let's talk about the first one, altitude or z-axis. So today, uh, the World Bank says that 55% of the world's population lives in an urban environment. And by 2050, that's going to be 70%. So you have a lot of people, very dense, squeezed into small spaces, which means in order to accommodate that density, you have to build up. That means multi-story apartment buildings, multi-story uh, office buildings, etc. If somebody is calling from one of these buildings, they're calling from the 10th floor, getting x, y coordinates during the emergency call is not going to be very helpful to you because your first responders still have to search up and down all the different floors of the building, which is where z-axis comes in. So today, we transmit z-axis location for HTTP messages only. Um, and in fact, the other, two, the other features that I'm going to talk about also uh, are only for HTTP, but that's why we have uh, ELS data SMS 2.0, which I'll cover later. So um, today, you can see that altitude is transmitted in the HTTP message. Uh, it is in a format called height above ellipsoid, which complies with WGS84 standards. That is uh, so the same sort of uh, standard format that GPS uses. We have been live in the US um, transmitting this information for over a year, but we know that it's kind of not very useful to public safety because you actually need to know what floor somebody is on within you know, plus or minus a floor or so. Um, but today, uh, because the U.S. Federal Communications Commission has a mandate for z-axis that says by April 2022, 80% of emergency calls have to have z-axis accuracy within plus or minus three meters, our engineering team is focused on meeting this mandate. Once they have done that, we will go back to working on floor information. So you can see we have z-axis in height above ellipsoid. We have an accuracy radius for, for z-axis. And then this is floor information. Don't get excited. This is very much a research and development project right now. And the chances of your getting an ELS message with floor information today is very, very, very low. Um, as I said, the team will go back to working on this once um, we, we meet the uh, FCC mandate. OK, so additional data. We realize that an emergency location is the most important information, but we also think that providing you with additional data that can give 112 call takers situational awareness is, is very helpful. So I'll talk about a couple of these. First, I want to talk about our goals and principles. Um, privacy is the most important thing, and so we'll adhere to the highest privacy standards. And our goal is to always give users, whoops, sorry, a meaningful way to control whether or not they want to share that additional data with you. Then secondly, um, sometimes having too much data is not very helpful, so we will always try and give you the right content at the right time and prioritize the most impo important content. So the first piece of additional data that we pass through ELS HTTP today is language. This is the default language setting on the phone. For those of you who live in countries where you have a lot of international visitors who may not be fluent in your local language, this can be very important because it can save you a few seconds to a few minutes in terms of finding the appropriate translation resource. 99% uh, of our uh, ELS messages today have language. The next one is car crash detection. So Pixel phones today can automatically detect when the user has been in a car crash. Um, and help provide this information to first responders. So here's kind of what happens if uh, the phone detects that the user has been in a car crash, and it's based on the impact that it, the sensors on the phone pick up and the magnitude. We've done a lot of testing to make sure that, you know, if you drop the phone on the ground, uh, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna send a car crash message, right? Um, car crashes happen a lot in the US. Maybe you guys are better drivers in Europe, and so you're not as concerned about it, but we have this ability. So when the phone detects that there's a car crash, the phone is going to vibrate, and then it's going to ring really loudly, and it's going to ask the user if they need help. And this is going to happen on the device, as well as you know it will be spoken aloud on the phone. So you can see the question is, um, they will initiate a voice call, uh, 
to 112 and uh, transmit the user's approximate location. And the call taker will hear this. You are being contacted by an automated voice service, blah, 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 all that stuff. At the same time, because an emergency call has been dialed, ELS will also fire up and transmit the user's location as well as an indication that um, this is a car crash. The important thing for you to remember is this will not, this car crash service will not interfere with the voice call. So as a 112 telecommunicator, you can still continue to talk to the caller. A um, couple of other things to note. This is obviously, uh, this is a, works on Pixel 3 and later today, available in English, Spanish, and Japanese in a handful of countries, US, UK, Ireland, Spain, Singapore, Australia, and Japan. Our goal, obviously, is to expand it, make it available globally in as many languages as possible, and to make it available on non-Pixel phones. So stay tuned on that. Uh, ELS Data SMS 2.0. Why are we doing ELS Data SMS 2.0? Because we want to update the original 1.0 spec to include fields that we think might be useful, additional data fields that I talked about, language, z-axis, et cetera. We will continue to support uh, ELS Data SMS 1.0. ELS Data SMS 2.0, just like 1.0, will conform with uh, the specification that Ina is proposing to Etsy for um, AML 2.0, but being Google, we may include a few additional parameters that Etsy may not include in their specification of 2.0, such as the emergency number dial, the default language, etc. We are currently pi piloting ELS Data SMS 2.0 with one country, but we would left, love to have more countries um, deploy this. Here is kind of some of the new fields that we've added to ELS data SMS messages. There's the emergency number called. There's vertical axis and language tags. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Alistair to talk about roaming. Thanks, Joanna. So I'm going to give a little bit of a, a, an introduction to some of the many options available uh, to support roaming these days. And so we're going to start off with the, probably the, the simplest of approach, which is long number. So this is, this is an approach that works just the same as if you were making an international call with anyone. Uh, you include the country code and a kind of a long telephone number. And we can configure this uh, for countries to allow an ELS SMS to be sent directly to the PSAP. Now, one of the challenges with this approach is that the ELS message actually then goes to the visited network, to the home network, and then back to the PSAP. And so what we find is that when the, these approaches are very error prone, there's a lot of ways that the SMS can kind of get lost on this transition. And also, users can, uh, can get some data charges uh, due to making international SMSs. Our second option, which I think uh, uh, the orange team are going to be talking about shortly is uh, the orange Belgium approach. And so this approach is where you set up a, a local SMSC with one of the local carriers in the country. And then what we can do is we can configure ELS to direct those ELS messages via, the, um, via this SMSC. The idea here is that you don't want the SMS even leaving the country. And also by doing this, you're working with the carriers to be able to configure this route and it means that the SMS can be uh, zero, zero cost to the user and thus much better, uh, much less error rates. And then the final approach for roaming that we, we, we also advocate for is HTTP. As you all know, like roaming has, is becoming increasingly better when, uh, when traveling. Uh, especially in Europe. And so what we hope is when um, users make these emergency calls, a HTTP message can simply go straight to the, to the PSAP. Um, in addition, it also works over Wi-Fi, so it means if a user is in a hotel or something like that, they can still make their ELS message through to their PSAP. And then when comparing these error rates, as you can see, the SMS long number approach has quite a high error rate of around 90%. Uh, this is for those reasons that we discussed earlier. The data SMS Orange Belgium option is much better at around 60%, uh, but please note that the data SMS option would have had lower error rates if all networks could accept seamless messages. The final approach, HTTP, as you can see, has an even lower rate than this, 
um, and we really hope that more, more, and, more, more and more partners will, will be adopting this, because in addition, HTTP also includes those goodies like additional data that Fiona just talked about. One thing we should also note about roaming is it doesn't have to be a one solution. It can actually be multiple of these solutions combined. And so it could be that users don't have um, a, a, da a data connectivity. But in the Wi-Fi approach, that's where HTTP can be the best. Similarly, they, the, the problem with the MSI SDN that we talked about earlier can be alleviated by also having the, the SMSs go to, and you can do some matchings on the two messages to actually to work out what the HTTP message, what, user, uh, what phone number that was. And so with that, I'm going to pass on to, I believe, the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, so next, um, we are going to hear from um, Eddie uh, Joffen. He is with Belgium Orange, or Orange Belgium. Can we have the video, please? Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Eddie Goffin. I am responsible for rooming and interconnection architecture definition within Orange Innovation. I will have the pleasure to present to you the solution put in place in Belgium to offer also advanced mobile location for rumors. Just before starting this presentation, a brief introduction on Orange. Orange is a global operator active on business service, retail and wholesale. Orange is serving more than 262 million customers. Orange is really active in research and innovations. More than 600 million has been invested in the past. Now, let's move on the core of this presentation. Like in a lot of countries, IML has been deployed in Belgium, but service was only available for local users. In case of emergency call to 112 or 101, local number for emergency in Belgium, IML generate an SMS including GPS location information and SMS is forwarded to the emergency centers. Location information could be then collected by the operator in call and if IML information is not available, network information, it means cell ID, could be collected by the operator. Quickly, Orange investigates the possible solution to extend IML to rumor. Two major requirements have been identified. Rooming in customers must benefit of IML when calling emergency service and IML must be free of charge for the user. The major issue with SMS is due to home routing mechanism apply in case of rooming. It means that all SMS generated by a rumor will be forwarded to the home network and managed by the home SMSC. Two solutions taking into account the routing mechanism are described in the Etsy TR103 to support IML for a rumor. Option 1. A long number is used for SMS IML destination. Based on SMS destination number, the home SMSC will be able to reroute SMS to the visited networks via the SMS international interconnection. For us, this solution is not optimal for three major reasons. First, SMS need to trombone via the international networks, 
with the risk of SMS interworking issue and by the end the SMS is not delivered to the PSAP. Second point, the SMS interconnection is not fully uh, secure. It means that the SMS long number could be used by fraudsters to generate DOS attack and by the end affect the emergency center. Last point, SMS need to be free of charge for rumors. It means that we have the obligation to request to all rooming partners to define SMS long number like free of charge. Option two, with this option, short or long number could be used, but the home SMSC should be configured to make SMS free of charge and configured to route the SMS to the local PSAP. By the end, we expect that the PSAP are interconnected together to make possible the transfer of the SMS IML from the home PSAP to the visited PSAP. It seems not realistic. For us, IML must be managed only by the visited networks without impact on the home network. Based on IML Android option, it is possible to define a specific SMSC address which will be used in case of SMS IML in place of the normal home SMSC. These features make possible to keep full control in the visiting networks if in the same time we define a new virtual SMSC using this specific AML SMSC address. Attention, the new AML SMSC address you need to include visited country code to prevent possible barring defined by the home networks and the new Virtual SMSC security rules should be defined to prevent malicious usage. It means that SMSC is only accessible to users located on Orange Belgium networks and the SMS destination numbers is restricted to 112 number used to access emergency centers. All other destination numbers will be discarded. To guarantee that SMS will be free of charge, MSC SMSMO TAP file is rate to zero. No billing for this kind of SMS. This solution is two major advantage. Solution avoid tromboning and the solution is fully independent of the home network. After a period of test between Orange and Authority, IML for rumor, as described in the previous slide, has been deployed in Belgium. Deployment in two uh, phases. The first one operators configure new virtual SMSC plus 32.1.1.2 and configure routing in the networks. Second step, Android via OS updates deploy the new AML configuration for rumors. It means that with this update, a rumor located in Belgium will receive a new IML configuration with the new SMSC plus 32.1.1.2. Now, in case of uh, emergency, all SMS also generated by rumors is forwarded directly by the visited networks to the PSAP. GPS location information is no available for rumors in Belgium. As a conclusion, solution is simple to put in place for mobile operators Investments are limited to OPEX for network configuration purpose 
no need to invest in new hardware. The solution is fully managed by the visited networks. We are fully independent of the home networks. The solution has a limited impact on the operating system AML. Pay attention, today the solution is only supported by Android. The solution is easily replicable. The solution is still applicable in 2G, 3G, 4G. Pay attention, if we use the SMS over IP technology, some adaptations are needed to keep the control of the SMS on the visited networks. We are arriving at the end of this short presentation. If you need more information regarding the solution put in place in Belgium to support IML also for a rumor, please do not hesitate to contact me. Many thanks to you for your attention. Goodbye. Good, thank you. Okay, we have plenty of time for questions. Yes, right back there. The good part about this schedule is that we're not the ones holding the happy hour up. The audience is, so. There was a question over here. Um, from Google, we heard that there are three possible ways to send the, uh, the, the information to the PSAP, and one of them was HTTP. But if you use HTTP without Wi-Fi, so directly through uh, the access network of an operator, then that cannot be zero rated. So does that imp uh, impact the choice that Android will make which mechanism to use? Go ahead. Or does yeah, the, the problem with HTTP, yes, is it cannot be zero rated um, unless the endpoint that is set up uh, is whitelisted the URL for the HTTP endpoint is whitelisted so that no, no traffic that goes to it um, is ever charged anything. Okay, another one? This is a question in the back. Uh, hi, Brandon Ampley with uh, Nina. Now, it's a question for Fiona, and, and I think you'll probably be mad at me for asking. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, a lot of history there, but um, you touched on f uh, floor levels being estimated. Um, we know that estimation always includes uncertainty, and, and there's great danger in just providing uh, any civic address elements, you know, without context. Um, so can you touch on any thoughts regarding uncertainty with an estimated floor level, acknowledging that it's still R&D phase at this point? Yeah, our goal is to be able to provide floor level information with uh, an uncertainty of plus or minus one floor. It's going to be challenging because depending on the countries you're in, even within the U.S., building heights, I mean, ceiling, floor heights are different. Um, you have some, you know, that are 11 feet, some are 9 feet. So it's a very tough problem to to tackle. I don't think we have the answer to it yes, yet. But you could argue that you face the same problem when you're talking about XY locations as it pertains to a civic address, um, which is the other thing that the FCC in the US wants, something called dispatchable location, the door to kick down. If we give you an address you know, based on X latitude, longitude, we'll say we think the user is at one you know, Union Street, how do we convey the uncertainty uh, of that address as well? It, it's kind of this, do you say plus or minus two houses next door, or, or how does it work if it's, so we're, we're all struggling with that. I don't think we have the answer for it yet. Uh, before we go to this question, I have to apologize. I went on an order here. I forgot to introduce Salatori okay. Bulgari. You're wondering why you're sitting on stage right now, right? I'm sorry <laughs> yes. about that. No, That's no, my no. bad. Uh, but we have one more presentation from Salvadori, who's from Google as well, and then we'll go back to the Q&A. So, he hello everybody. Um, so, I'm Salvo, working for Google, but today I think I'm something between you and drinks, so I'll try to be fast. <laughs> um, so, this presentation is about error rates and ways we can help you troubleshoot problems. As somebody much more important than myself said, um, 
you can torture numbers long enough and they will confess anything. So we really care about whoever has AML active, but we also care about how many of those messages are actually received by PSAPs. Those are lives that we can help uh, save. So what is um, error for us? This is more or less the system that we deal with. There is an ELS call, we compute the location, the blue dot in Google Maps, and then we send the location, and the location is received by, by, by your system. So there are two ways that we can have errors. We can have errors when we compute the location. Uh, that, that's one case, but the vast majority of cases is when we send the location and we have or a timeout, uh, or the location is not received. We don't receive uh, an acknowledgement back. So what is error rate? Error rate for us is the amount of failures that we see divided by the amount of messages that are sent. And error rates can be very different across countries. And uh, we look at uh, AML as a global system, so we, we have visibility on the error rates per country and per operator. Um, so you see some error rates could be around 6%, and they can go up at 20%. In other countries, it could be at 20%. But the key thing is sometimes error rates are dependent on mobile operators. So you have situations where all the mobile operators, like country one, are behaving very well. They are delivering messages. And just one operator is enough to send the average up. And we see we have that level of granularity. Um, common root causes for uh, errors and drop rates. So one is MNOs, sometimes they hold messages during emergency calls, and this is very difficult to detect, because I, I think I, I, we repeat it several times, we don't see the message, we don't have visibility on what is sent. The message goes from the device through the network to the piece up. So that's, that's a very difficult for us to, to debug. Second case is, um, I've been in several uh, talks today, and uh, they were talking about uh, uh, migration of networks from 3G to 4G and from 4G to 5G, and one of those technologies is the fallback. So when you have a 4G or LTE network, um, and, and you have to fall back to 2G or 3G because the phone doesn't support SMS over IP, you have failures in sending the SMS. And that's another of the root causes. The, th the third one is SMS over IP. So you can connect to a 4G network as a user, but if your phone doesn't send SMSs over IP, that message is not sent and therefore uh, not received. So in that case, we need more phones and more phone manufacturers to support SMS over IP. And this will be more and more common because most of the operators in the world, they are shutting down 3G. So fallback will fail more and more uh, in the future. Um, we detect errors, but we fix them. Uh, so if you look at the yellow line, when we detect what the problem is and that we try to help as much as we can here, uh, we see the drop rate going down and more and more uh, messages being correctly received. Now, how can we fix that? Um, back to this original picture, we are working on making sure that the location is computed correctly. So that, that's on us. Uh, but when we send the location, again, we don't have visibility. There are multiple stakeholders involved in that. So the same diagram from a different perspective involves different parties. There is Google. We are responsible for computing the blue dot in Google Maps. We try to do that very well. But then there is the mobile operator that handles the SMS or I internet in general. And then there is the service that is responsible for receiving uh, the content of that message, which is the ELS partner. What can possibly go wrong? Uh, so uh, debugging a problem there requires cooperation across all parties. We see that there is a problem, but we just see the message that we see the amount of messages sent, and we see the amount of messages that come back with an error. And so we try to get all the parties involved, and it's very difficult to, uh, to, to find the root cause there. That's why it's important that we involve MNOs across the country, and we involve the ELS partner. Uh, that's an elephant, by the way. Um, so troubleshooting 101, what do you do when you want to troubleshoot something? Um, what? One, I recommend what we call a joint session in a network uh, lingo. So you try to involve everybody to run a debug session. You make a lot of calls, and you try to look at the logs from every perspective, from our perspective, network perspective, etc. 
How do you do that? You run 50 to 100 emergency calls through the LS Manager app, but you do that with different models, ideally the most popular phones in your country. You do that in different locations, and, and then you compare the, the results. Where do you do that? Uh, you can do that in live network, you can do that in a lab. Uh, most of the mobile operators are very willing to give you access to their lab and simulate scenarios of different, uh, different networks. Um, and you do this with different infra vendors. Every mobile operator in the world doesn't want to have an, a network with just one provider. They normally split with at least two or three providers. Um, why do you do that? So uh, you can send and trace the process of the, ELM, the, the message end to end. In that case, then you can see where the problem is. You can see if the problem is in the endpoint. You can see if the problem is in, in the network. And then we can try to better understand how to fix that. And as you could see from the slide beforehand, we do fix that. So it's, it's important that we uh, activate more and more users, but it's important that we make sure that those messages go across the, across the network. And that was my last slide. OK, great. We'll go back to questions. Um, and again, I apologize, but Selvi, uh, before we go to another question, I had one. Um, you you're talked about some of the issues dealing with sending these SMS messages between old handsets and different networks, you know, 3G, 4G. What changes for AML, if anything, as more consumers start to go on to 5G networks and as more PSAPs work in the in NG911 environment? How is it, AM, what are the new, are there new issues? Are there new opportunities for AML? I mean, what does that, that, that environment look like for you? So pr from our perspective, send, from our perspective, sending an SMS is exactly the same call to our API. So it goes to the modem of the phone and then the modem is responsible for sending that message. So what, what we recommend is, as I said, get the most popular phone manufacturers in your country and, and make sure that those phones support the latest technologies, 4G and now, and now 5G. Most of the networks, the 3G and 2G networks, will be off very soon. And s some operators, I think I saw a slide about Swisscom in Switzerland, has already 3G off. So any phone that tries to make a fallback to send an SMS will drop that SMS. And, and th that's a location that could be transmitted. That's one life that can be saved. I try always to remind myself that every message really, really matters. So what, what we can do is we can talk to phone manufacturers and we can talk to uh, to mobile providers to, to make sure that they take that into account when they sunset a specific technology. Yeah. What about for PSAPs when they start operating in an NG911 environment? How does AML change for them from their perspective at all? No, it shouldn't should change start. anything. I mean, you know, we have a HTTP where we send the information and it should work just fine in NG112, NG911 environment. Mm -hmm. I did want to say one I think important point from Salvo's presentation. So when he said, you know, we solve it, actually we don't solve it. The ELS partner solves it. It's your responsibility if you're an ELS partner to troubleshoot if we, if we contact you because we can see that there's a high error rate in your country or for an MNO in your country. We contact you, we share this information, but then you as the ELS partner, it's your responsibility to do the test calls because you're in country you have access to the sims, the networks are live around you, and you theoretically also have a good relationship with the MNOs and the PSAP. So you have to do the testing, and we can try and consult, but you have to drive it as the ELS partner. Yeah, de definitely. We, 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 as you can see, we're a small team, <laughs> and we try to <laughs> handle so many countries and so many MNOs, it's, it's difficult to troubleshoot everything, right? Okay. Great, terrific. I know there was a question in the back earlier. Do you still have one? If I may just add before uh, to uh, continue what was said, uh, that tomorrow we'll have a session on location in... Uh, Next generation emergency communication tomorrow afternoon. Good. Okay, over here on the side. Oh, okay, we'll do that one first, yeah. Uh, another question, I think, for Fiona with the, the Z-axis. Um, with a lot of companies missing out floors and the debate of first floor or ground floor, is Google looking at mapping what floors are where in some of the big commercial tower blocks? No, we, well, we, we did have an attempt to try and map uh, major commercial areas like shopping malls and airports and stuff like that, but it, we, it's not scalable. Um, and so I know some countries like Austria and Iceland have been very good about having 
regulations in place when new buildings are, are built, like they all have to submit floor plans. In the US, that's starting to happen more and more. Some PSAPs in certain regions are paying um, companies to, to map uh, using LIDAR. So there's ways around it, um, but it's not something that Google can solve on its own. Okay, in the corner over there. Yeah, it's uh, Brandon and Nina again. I guess it's more of a, a comment than a question. It's a follow-up to your, your question about NG with location. Um, so the, the originating service provider includes location information um, in when they set up the call and the SIP invite in NG. So with, um, like with a service like this, the original source of the values that goes in that location changes. You know, but from the carrier side on, it, it all um, is the same as always. And I should add that, you know, the thing with SIP invite is uh, not everybody has, is using it right now. We learned that in our um, workshop yesterday. Um, and SIP invite today sends one location. So we are trying to um, push to have uh, SIP invite, SIP update location every 20 to 25 seconds into the call um, by adding a field called SIP update or what have you. So um, it's one way to get around that. Over there on the side. Robert Manenica from Croatian Telecom, mobile network operator. So just a comment, a lot about the network evolution stuff, how things are going, 2IP, 2,4G, 2G, 3G, are here rather relative and should be tuned because somehow the message which comes over is, is a bit untrue. So just a small warning because I'm com I come from the telecom operator, and things about 4G, 3G, what will we turn off, what will work, for what we need SIP over IP, it is here a bit messy. So I think when we give over such a information, it should be validated from someone who has heads on, hands on. And uh, my impression is that this wasn't checked from someone who understands the telco business. We'll come talk to you, Robert. I mean, <laughs> I, I know that when we deployed ELS in one country, um, we saw very high error rates with one, well, we saw high error rates with one mobile network operator and the other two were fine. And it turns out it was an SMS over IP issue and there was nothing the operator could do about it. We had to, we essentially said, we have to live with this 20 something percent error rate until the older phones age out of their um, installed base and they have newer phones that can that can support SMS over IP, but we'll come talk to you more about it. Okay. Any other questions? None at all? Oh, okay. Over here. Hello. Uh, Vasilis Kazoukas from Greece. Uh, I noticed in uh, this uh, presentation that uh, it is a <coughs> there is a possibility of AML in uh, seamless uh, calls. Uh, in which countries it is implemented, in which carriers and countries is implemented in Europe? Are there any countries? No, whatever, I mean, we deploy a, a ELS as a, it's a global service, nobody gets a special version of it, so, uh, seamless calls is, is a big issue. It came up in the workshop yesterday, and uh, I'm not sure we have an answer for that right now. Okay. It seems like it's a pretty small percentage for most countries. Um, so. Yeah, okay. Right. Another question here? Thank you, Gary. Uh, Athena, uh, I was wondering among those of you from public authorities who already have AML, how many of you are following more or less what uh, the process that Google has defined to check for error rates and to solve them? Please raise your hand. Please raise your hand in case you're doing so. Yeah. So, sorry for the match. Um, how many of you are actually following a, a process, a very defined process to check for error rates? So to try to solve these error rates in MNOs that Google presents. Do you guys have a real working group working on that with MNOs, etc.? cetera? Mm -hmm. Over there. Okay. So only two in the room, three. 
just just a little comment on my on my side. It's a little bit scary because I mean we have a private company, Google here. I mean thanks a lot, guys, for your efforts. But I mean, public authorities need to do that work as we raised it in, in a webinar some 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 month ago. I mean it's really important that we tackle these error rates uh, with with the leadership under the leadership of public authorities, national public authorities. I agree with Maybe you. the next ENA conference to get an award. And we have a detailed, we, we did a one and a half hour webinar with ENA members um, six months ago or something, where we went into error rates, Salvo's presentation, but much more expanded with uh, a lot of Q&A. So go look it up on the ENA website if you want to get more information, okay. where we do step by step kind of how you troubleshoot and stuff. All right, any other questions? We've got two minutes left. None? Okay. We will close two minutes early. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>